example, which is um, Mir Kumanon. And I'm really delighted to present uh, Professor Jeffrey Chandler, who will be presenting this film. Let me just tell you a little bit about him. Um, uh, professor Chandler is Distinguished Professor of Jewish Studies at Rutgers University. His books include While America Watches, Televising the Holocaust, Holocaust Memory in the Digital Age, Survivor Survivors' Stories, and New Media Practices, and most re recently, Yiddish, a Biography of a Language. Uh, among other titles, Chandler is the editor of Awakening Lives, Autobiographies of Jewish Youth in Poland Before the Holocaust, which is a great collection to use for educators. Um, he's the co-editor of Anne Frank Unbound, Media, Imagination, and Memory. Uh, and his translations of Yiddish literature include Emil and Carl, a Holocaust novel for young readers by Yankov, very famous author Yankov Glotstein. I'm delighted, and he has many other books which are not on this list. Um, I'm really delighted, Professor Chandler, that you're here. And without, without further ado, I'm turning the floor to you. Thank you very much, Paul. I want to thank Paul uh, and also uh, Liz Edelstein for inviting me to uh, speak with you today about one of my all-time favorite films, Merkuman On. What I'm going to do to set this up uh, is talk about um, the context in which this film was made. Uh, this is a film made in 1935 about uh, the Medem Sanatorium, uh, and I'll explain more about what that is. Uh, and it provides us with uh, an extraordinary glimpse of one aspect of Jewish life in Poland between the two world wars, focusing on one of a number of approaches they took to public health. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the Yiddish Arbeiterbund, the Jewish Labor Bund, a political party that um, established the sanatorium. And I'll talk a little bit about the film itself. Then we're gonna watch the film. Uh, Paul will tell us uh, uh, about how we're going to deal with watching the film and then um, uh, convening afterwards for some uh, questions and answers. So, uh, the context. Um, uh, after World War I, Poland is established as uh, an independent republic, which it hadn't been uh, for, for, for many years. Uh, as part of the uh, redrawing of the map of Eastern Europe after the war. Uh, it has the largest Jewish population in Europe. There are about 3 million Jews living there in 1930. They're 10% of the country's population. Uh, Jews are now citizens of a republic before they were subjects of empires, but now they're citizens and according to the Versailles Treaty, have minority rights, including the right to uh, their own educational, cultural, and political organizations. Now, within this population of three million uh, Polish Jews, there is extensive internal diversity. Uh, politically, you have people on the left, you have people on the right. Uh, you have people who are Zionists, you have people who aren't Zionists. Religiously, you have Jews who are very pious, some of them Hasidic, some of what we would now today call yeshivish. Uh, you also have Jews that are very secular. Uh, they also have different commitments to language. Uh, some believe it's important to integrate into the Polish language mainstream. Others are championing uh, Hebrew as a modern vernacular language, which is a very new movement at the time. Others are advocating for Yiddish, the traditional vernacular of Jews throughout Eastern Europe for, for centuries. And even other people are advocating for Esperanto, an international language invented by a Polish Jew uh, that was going to uh, help bring about world peace. Uh, so that gives you just some sense of how internally diverse this community is. Uh, by the time this film was made, 19, uh, mid-1930s, the situation of Jews in Poland had gotten more challenging. Um, uh, the depression that uh, hit the United States in 1929, it hit Europe as well. And uh, they were suffering economically from this worldwide uh, uh, economic collapse. Also, starting in 1935, uh, right-wing politi uh, political parties uh, came to power in Poland, and they created increased challenges for Jews, both economically and socially. So that's important background for the sanatorium and for the film. The sanatorium, the Medem Sanatorium, is an educational and clinical facility for children and young adults 
especially those who are at risk for tuberculosis. It's located in a town near Warsaw called Nienjeshin. Uh, it opened in 1926. It actually continued to function through 1942. Uh, what the sanatorium is closest to that would be familiar to uh, folks in the United States is the Fresh Air Fund, which was uh, established in 1877, uh, which provides physical and also mental health care out in the countryside for poor urban youth who are members of a minority that is often stigmatized. Well, that is exactly the same situation that Jews living in slums in, in Warsaw, other big cities uh, uh, were facing. And the sanatorium provided them with uh, not only getting them out into the fresh air of the countryside, but also with um, uh, important social and, and mental health care. Uh, approximately 10,000 children were treated at the Men in Sanatorium between 1926 and the start of World War II in 1939. And it is one of a number of public health institutions that were created by and for the Jewish community in interwar Poland, some of which I gather you've already heard about uh, in the, from the previous speakers. Now, the Men in Sanatorium is named after Vladimir Medem, uh, who had been a leader of the, the uh, Jewish Labor Bund. Uh, he died in 1923, so shortly before the sanatorium opened. Uh, and it was funded by donations from Jewish labor unions in Poland and in the United States. And uh, until 1935, it received some public funds from municipal authorities and health insurers to cover some of their costs. So let me say a little bit about the Bund, the Jewish Labor Bund, Yiddish Arbiter Bund, was founded in Russia in 1897 as a revolutionary party. It was the first revolutionary party of any kind in Tsarist Russia. Uh, in interwar Poland, it became one of a number of Jewish political parties, which ran candidates for elected offices and offered an array of programs to Polish Jews. They published newspapers and other periodicals. They had a school system. They supported labor unions. They had youth movements. They had sports teams and they had public health programs such as the one that we're gonna look at today. The Bund had a very uh, distinctive approach uh, politically and Jewishly. First of all, it was a socialist party. They were committed to improving the lives of working class people. And at the time, the great majority of Jews living in Poland and, and throughout Eastern Europe were working class. Uh, the Bund Jewishly was very secular in its commitments. Uh, also, they were very pro-diaspora. They were not Zionists. And they espoused the principle of what in Yiddish was called doikait, D-O-I-K-E-Y-T, if you want to spell it out in transcription, which means hereness, H-E-R-E, uh, -E, uh, do or do in Yiddish means here. And the idea was the Bund said, Jews have a right to live here, wherever here is, as Jews with cultural autonomy and as citizens of the country with the same right as everybody else. Which when you think about it is probably how most American Jews see themselves as having uh, the same desires of the right to be Jews as they wish to be and the right to be citizens along with everybody else with the same rights. Uh, the Bund was also very pro Yiddish and they were committed to elevating the stature of Yiddish as a Jewish national language. They worked on developing the sanatorium together with a secular Yiddish school system called Sisho, Centrale Yiddish Schul Organizatia, the Central Yiddish School Organization. It was founded in Poland in 1921, and it was allied not only with the Bund, but also with left-wing labor Zionists. Uh, and while they disagreed on Zionism, they were both very pro-labor, and they were both very committed to Yiddish. Um, and this was one of a range of new educational options for Jews living in interwar Poland. Uh, the film we're going to see, Mir Kumen On, which means in Yiddish, we're arriving, we're on our way. The uh, title it was given in English was Children Must Laugh. So it's not a translation, it's sort of an alternative title. And it was filmed at the sanatorium in 1935. The director is Alexander Ford. Um, who's a very interesting figure in the history of film. First of all, uh, he was born Moshe Lifshitz in Kiev in 1908. Uh, he made films in Poland in the 1930s. During World War II, he made films for the Soviet Union, for the Red Army. 
Uh, after World War II, he was a leading figure in post-war Polish film. He trained some of the leading filmmakers of the next generation uh, of filmmakers until 1968, when, like many other Jews, he was forced to leave Poland. He then went to Israel and then to the United States, where he lived until he died in 1980. The film is what we would today call a docudrama. It's there. You will see elements of documentary filmmaking. You see filming of actuality with actual people, but you also see um, that uh, there are stage scenes that a narrative is created, especially in the film we follow three children who come to the sanatorium. And so it has this mix of documentary and dr dramatic elements. And the reason the film was made is that it's a fundraising film. It was shown uh, primarily in the United States to raise money from American Jews for the sanatorium. And in that respect, it's a very uh, pioneering effort to use film for this purpose. Uh, this was a pretty new idea generally, not just in the Jewish world, to use film and photography for fundraising purposes or for public relations campaigns. Probably the most famous example of this uh, uh, in the Jewish world at the time, uh, uh, with regard to Eastern Europe, were photographs that Roman Vishniak took in the late 1930s uh, in Poland and other countries nearby for the Joint Distribution Committee that were used uh, both to raise funds among American Jews, uh, but also as part of a public relations campaign to enlighten the world about the challenges Jews in Eastern Europe were facing. And these photos after the war become probably the most famous images of Jewish life before uh, the war. So that's what I have to offer in the way of introduction. And uh, my guess is folks will have additional questions after they've seen the film, which we can address uh, uh, following the screening. So Paul, I'm gonna turn things back over to you so you can tell us uh, what we should do. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff, for uh, for that introduction, and uh, which, which really packed a lot of uh, information about the um, uh, ab about the Mir Kumanon and, of course, the background uh, that created the film. Right. Thank so, you. Um, so I have a few more questions as well. Uh, a follow up to that question is: um, uh, Was this sanitarium kosher, or do you uh know? No, I don't know, but I, I can't imagine that it wasn't because uh, Salman's parents wouldn't send him there, right? And frankly, a lot of these Bundists kept kosher by habit or because, you know, the grandparents are going to come over for dinner and you have to be able to, you know, they have to sit at your table. Um, and, you know, if you grow up with that as your way of eating and it's just sort of naturalized, uh, it's not necessarily um, an ideological commitment. Uh, so, you know, I don't know that for a fact, but I can't imagine that it wouldn't be for that for that simple reason. Um, and uh, I'll see if I can find out because I've always wanted to know that. Uh, yeah. And I also, I would assume that kids who are religious and who are Shomer Shabbos, who observe the Sabbath, uh, would be excused from like, you know, uh, picking crops on Saturdays, um, you know, but maybe you'll feed the animals because that is something you are supposed to, you're supposed to take care of your, your livestock. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's raises interesting uh, questions, but I think given their uh, commitment to supporting the rights of Jews to be the kind of Jews they want to be, that that would be accommodated. Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, so here is another question. Uh, let's see here. I, th I think that's from, from, is that from you, Liz? I don't understand the question. No, okay. All right, so let me, um, okay. So uh, do you know of any of these children? Okay, we see the children in the movie. Right. First of all, the children in the movie, did we know if any of them survived or played any other roles after the movie, because so, I know that that but that uh, Vladik said, uh, BC Vladik said in the beginning that some of them. No, it wasn't Vladik. It was later on. It was I think in the in the in the little in the in the text in the beginning said that some of them were in the resistance after the or during the war. Right. So um, there are there are uh, people who are in the film after they might who might be just in the background not any of the sort of the lead characters as it were um who uh who who do survive um uh the war 
Uh, and, um, uh, you know, there um, and I think they've been, you know, been interviewed. I'm, I'm not sure, or at least have, you know, have talked about uh, their experience at the Met. And there are, of course, other kids who went to the Met and Sanatorium who didn't happen to be there the year this film was recorded. Because after all, there were, you know, starts in the, in the mid-20s. And there were kids going there from that point. And remarkably, they are able to, you know, during the, when the war starts and Poland is invaded, it's shut down. But then the Bund reopens it and manages to keep it going until it's taken over in, in 42 and the Nazis round up whoever's there and uh, uh, take them to their death in, in, in Treblinka. So, um, uh, but there are uh, people who had been there earlier uh, and possibly even, you know, after 35, before 39, um, who um, uh, uh, then uh, are involved in resistance in some cases, uh, some cases don't survive, but in, in some cases uh, uh, did survive one way or another. There may also be people who uh, left Poland before the war among, I mean, there's 10,000 children. Uh, some of them may have uh, left Poland uh, before the war started who were, who were at the sanatorium. So, okay, and I had a, a, a few more questions here. Um, so um, I guess uh, a couple of people noted that they, they thought that the voices were dubbed. Uh, and I guess there was also a question about the minors at the end, yeah. uh, whether those those children were Jewish or non-Jewish. I right. just don't know if you know anything about that. Right. No, they're definitely not. And that what the 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 point of including that in the film is actually quite remarkable because um, the you know part of the commitment of the Bund is uh, definitely. Um, concerned for taking care of your fellow Jews and your fellow, especially your Jewish uh, working class. But also as socialists, you're committed to the international uh, um, uh, movement to improve the rights of working class people. And uh, that is, that's part of the mission. Uh, and so the fact that, you know, it's signaled very early, very early on in the film when they're doing the news report and they said, you know, the, the coal miners on strike and their children don't have anything to eat. It's like those coal miners are not only far away, none of them are Jews, you know? And yet we feel for them as fellow socialists. Uh, and, and therefore this idea that the kids say, let's, let's bring some kids here as an act of solidarity. And you see this, you know, half a dozen kids who, who show up at the end um, and this, you know, this reaching out to them. So this is an important ideological message. Um, there was another question before that that you asked that uh, I- uh, Oh, about the dubbing that the, some of the voices seem dubbed. The soundtrack is added later. Interesting. Uh, and um, so, uh, it, it, so a lot of a lot of the um, not only the music but a lot of a lot of even um, dialogue uh, is uh, is is added later in in the way the just the, the filmmaking is done and so it's um, uh, it, it, it's it's um, just you know the way this kind of film was put together um, and. Uh, it was filmed, by the way, in, in 35, but it wasn't shown until 38. And that was because of the time it took to put it together and to, to raise the money to, you know, produce it, make copies of it, take it to, to, to America. So that was, um, uh, that has a lot to do with uh, what I guess they would call post-production. Uh, I mean, and Alexander Ford, I, Alexander Ford, I believe, was a famous director, no? Yeah, he's very, he's very famous, probably even more famous uh, in, in the post-war period in Poland, so from like, you know, 45, 46, 47, until 68, when he's told to leave because he's a Jew, um, he is the head of Film Polski, which is the state-run, you know, from 48 on, a state-run film studio. And he, he makes films, but even more so, he trains the next generation of great Polish filmmakers, uh, Andrzej Wajda, Roman Polanski, I mean, uh, were his two most famous students, but others as well. And uh, so he's a really important figure in, uh, in Polish film. And when, after he leaves, he, you know, struggles to find, to have a career uh, in, in the United States. He's only in Israel briefly, then he comes to the United States and it never really quite happens. Um, 
But yeah, he has, he's a very, uh, a very important figure in, uh, in Polish film. Uh, no, thank you. Another, another question uh, that we have is, in what ways do you think that this movie was tailored specifically for an American audience? It's a really good question. Well, um, first of all, that really boring <laughs> introduction that, um, <laughs> let's, let's be honest, uh, not the liveliest bunch, but that clearly is framing it. Also, um, I would say that the American audience, yet one of the things we have to think about is most of them would be people who uh, at this point might be the children of immigrants, or if they were immigrants, they had come before 1924 for the most part, because that's when the quotas start to really restrict who can come to the United States from, from, from Eastern Europe. Uh, so uh, a lot of this is, uh, it's very similar to other uh, efforts uh, to campaign among uh, American Jews who are either immigrants or the children of immigrants uh, to say, look how tough the lives of your fellow Jews are. Look how they're suffering. Think about especially the opening sequence of the film, which is, you know, just these, uh, you know, the, the, the dark, uh, you know, nasty, crowded, unhealthy conditions of life in the slums. And, um, to uh, you know, say, look how bad these folks are, are suffering. You can help make their lives better. And this is very similar to other kinds of appeals. For example, Landsmannschaft were doing the exact same thing, but for their particular town, you know, these, these hometown organizations, some of whom made their own little films. And they would send somebody back and they'd film the conditions of the town and they say, look how bad things are. And um, you've got to help these people. And uh, so this is, um, and, and this is the role that American Jews take on after World War I, uh, when they're prospering and Jews in Europe aren't. And even in the 30s, when, you know, a lot of Jews are suffering during the Depression, they still are better off. And they still have this uh, very, you know, there's this very strong commitment that you have to help people, your, your fellow Jews in Europe, um, because they're worse off than you, and no one else is going to help them. And uh, that, th that is um, the, it, the, you know, partly explicit, partly tacit message in the film. The fact that no one else is going to help them doesn't get mentioned in the film, but that, that would be known to be the case. Right. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we're just about out of time.